Okay. Uh, so, uh, sorry, one second. Uh, I think I have not started recording. Could you? Okay. Yeah. Sure. Oh, okay. Sure, sure. Yeah. Started. Started. Start. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, thanks for having me virtually, and uh, thanks for attending this uh, winter school. Uh, finally, it's happening. So we have been planning from uh, early February, if I'm not wrong, and then. As you know, because of the pandemic, uh, all the plans uh, got screwed up and finally we are here. So uh, excited to talk about uh, CASES and uh, how the processor interacts with the memory in the next one hour or so. So uh, just a quick protocol uh, because we are not meeting physically. Uh, what I will do is I will pause once in a while. Uh, so the, these are the slide numbers I will pause uh, uh, and then, then I will take questions. And uh, because of the time constraint, uh, I don't think this take up slide should be uh, enough to get everything on gases. The goal is just to uh, get you uh, some 10,000 10, feet view and then uh, so that you, you will get up into your uh, curiosity zone and then start asking questions and then uh, dig deep uh, up to the end of the talk or the interschool. So uh, feel free to uh, email me or reach out for anything related to uh, this talk or the winter school. And then uh, in the MS team, uh, we have already created a channel. I think that I'll talk about it at the end that is specifically for the labs, uh, but you can ping me on the MS team for uh, anything related to the topic that I'm, I'm going to talk about or, or anything related to the winter school. So my uh, chat is on, so I'm using my mobile phone just to look at uh, the follow the questions. So if I get uh, let's say three five questions, then I'll stop and then uh, start uh, responding them, and then I'll move on. Okay. Okay. So with that, uh, let's start with uh, the lecture with uh, with assumption of the, there is no CAS, and uh, I'm assuming that most of you have heard about this term CAS, but let's go back uh, some 60, 70 years back where where there was no CAS. Okay. So Gobind already talked about the processor core. So you know about the processor out of order processor and you must have heard about uh, memory. So Vivek will talk about the nuances of DRAM sometime tomorrow. But for the time being, you assume this is a uh, memory that is a black box, which is green in color. And uh, to make it simple, uh, we are assuming this uh, 4 GB DRAM uh, so, uh, so that you will be uh, used to the, the, the numbers uh, pretty easily. And the way things work is the processor uh, interacts with the memory and uh, to get the data and the code, and that that takes uh, time, obviously, because the memory is actually off chip. Uh, processor is uh, actually situated uh, on chip, and that takes around hundreds of cycles. And then uh, the goal will be to minimize this uh, costly uh, DRAM accesses. So uh, before we jump into the world of CASES. There are two things that that drives the entire architecture research, uh, at, especially at least uh, in the uh, context of performance, and those two terms are latency and bandwidth. So we are trying to minimize the latency gap between the processor and the DRAM. Uh, as I mentioned, it's like hundreds of cycles. We should also take care about the bandwidth. Uh, so latency talks about how much time it takes to get a response from the DRAM. Uh, bandwidth talks about how much you can transfer at a given point of time, right? So in terms of bytes, so bytes per second. Uh, with that, uh, it's a famous quote, uh, not from computer architecture, but uh, from computer systems, just to highlight uh, the importance of latency problems. Uh, as you can see, the quote is bandwidth problems can be cured with money. You put more uh, channels or more bus, and then, then you will be able to transfer more data in less amount of time. But the latency problems are harder because the speed of light is fixed. Like you have to uh, like fuzz the physics lectures that you have gone through in your um, uh, like high school days. OK, so with that, uh, just a quick uh, reminder again why we access memory. So this is because of this uh, famous gentleman uh, known as uh, Von Neumann. So the idea was uh, we have a stored program concept where the data and uh, the instructions are actually stored in memory. And whenever the code wants to operate on that, it will demand the data and instructions from uh, the memory. OK, so that's why it, it creates a notion of wall uh, that that is known as the memory wall. And in the architecture community, it is termed as one of the grandmother of all the walls because the community is still working on this problem to hide this uh, latency of uh, getting data and the instruction from data. OK, so with, with that, uh, you, you may get a feel that 
if we want to improve our performance or processor performance or our uh, application performance, then the obvious idea should be uh, to reduce the number of DRAM accesses, right? So, so that the processor will get everything done uh, within on chip and you should not go off chip and eventually you'll get uh, improvement in your execution time. So that, that's where uh, the final uh, ball game. But it, it's it's not that straightforward. This is actually subtle. And uh, I'm just highlighting uh, one of the uh, key laws in performance, uh, not specific to architecture, but uh, in terms of system design. This is the Amdahl's law, which says make the common case fast, right? So which means if your program is actually not memory intensive, even if you try to uh, come up with techniques uh, that, that try to reduce the DRAM accesses, you won't get performance improvement. So the takeaway from this slide is uh, don't do anything just because it, you have read it somewhere or, uh, or or this is kind of textbook which says that, okay, CASs actually help, they improve performance. No, it's not like that. Assuming the program is memory intensive, it goes to DRAM frequently, then if you have uh, CASs, it may help. We will see how, okay? So uh, let's look at... Uh, our applications and the, the way they accesses the memory. So this is a pretty old plot from IBM, uh, almost 50 years. So the y-axis shows the addresses uh, and the x-axis show the time. Here you can see uh, what's happening uh, somewhere uh, that I have uh, marked in oval shape, that the same address is getting accessed uh, again and again, right? And another key point to uh, look at is there are adjacent addresses which are getting accessed uh, in, in, in a small window of time. So th this brings to the first principle of uh, CASs, which says that, okay, because our programs have locality, locality and addresses, so uh, which means if you can store these addresses at some place which is not there in uh, some place on chip, no, not uh, off chip, then we may get uh, better performance. Uh, instead of going to DRAM all the time, we may get uh, our data uh, in some buffer or some pool, and so that finally our performance will be improved. So a few examples uh, that, that you may correlate with, with your uh, programming uh, behavior. So uh, simple uh, for loops, kind of, where, where you are actually iterating over loops, or uh, simple stack accesses where you are entering into a function call uh, or routine and then, then do something and then come back. And then simple accesses, uh, let's say uh, array accesses or simple uh, particular array index uh, accesses, right? So uh, the, the highlight of uh, this slide is that if you look at the addresses, they are actually uh, kind of recurring and they are recurring uh, either in space, meaning uh, uh, the, the, the adjacent addresses are actually recurring, and uh, if not the adjacent addresses, the same address is coming again and again, okay? So with that, uh, the notion of caches come into picture. Uh, so uh, in my opinion, caching is just a speculation technique, uh, so I won't define it as a buffer or any other thing. So this is a speculation technique that works as long as your program has locality or your application has locality, okay? So if your application doesn't have locality, then uh, caches don't work. So it, it may make your uh, performance worse, okay? So let's look at the same figure again. And previously we had a DRAM for which uh, it used to take 200 to 300 cycles, but now we have a cache and uh, depending on the size of this cache, uh, the performance or your final execution time will go up or down, okay? And the goal will be to get the data uh, pretty quickly so that uh, the out-of-order processor uh, that, that Govin talked about uh, should uh, finish its instruction and commit uh, fast, okay? So we'll look into that uh, slowly. So uh, this brings to the first question, right? So how uh, small or large uh, uh, this particular cache will be? And uh, this can be correlated with your apartments, right? So one BHK to three BHK, and uh, if you are uh, searching for some stuff in a three BHK, it will take more time because you have to search three rooms compared to a one BHK, right? So the typical trade-offs are the latency because finally you are uh, your main primary goal is performance. So uh, lower the latency is better. And uh, but as you know that there are applications or workloads where that demands huge amount of uh, data, right? In MBs or GBs. So it may it may happen that even uh, capacity will be a good trade-off, right? 
So finally, uh, when you choose your cache size, you have to find out what exactly you want, whether you want uh, the latency or the capacity, and uh, those are the two knobs that, that drives the entire uh, world of caches. So uh, we can pause a bit and, and uh, ask questions like this. So what should be the ideal uh, cache size? Uh, can we implement the caches as registers? If not, why not? And uh, I will be talking about caches that are implemented as SRAM arrays. If you don't know what exactly is an SRAM, SRAM array, it's perfectly okay. Uh, Vivek uh, might talk about uh, the DRAM uh, caches uh, sometime tomorrow. But but uh, think about this terms and then uh, reason about why, why caches can't be implemented with registers. What will be the advantages or disadvantages if you implement caches as a SRAM array or a DRAM array? Okay. I won't go into the details of this, but we can discuss offline uh, after the talk or whenever uh, you feel like. OK, so uh, just to understand what Govind had talked about in the morning, uh, we have an out of order processor where the instructions are actually uh, getting fetched in order. So here I'm showing five instructions out of which three are memory instructions. They are load. They want to read something from the memory. And uh, this is a typical uh, scenario, let's say. So far we have looked at DRAM can take 300 sub cycles and then normal uh, arithmetic instructions can be done in uh, one or two cycles, right? And uh, this is out of order execution. So any instruction can uh, go and execute uh, depending on the dependencies. But finally, you have to complete or commit your instruction in the program order, right? To maintain the precise exception and then other things. So, the key point here is even if uh, your subtraction and multiplication instructions are done within one or two cycles, they can't complete or the output can't be uh, like broadcasted to the programmer until the first load is complete or commit. And that takes 300 cycles. So eventually it means that all the instructions have to wait till the first instruction is over, okay, or it's done, right? So Ideally, the processor should uh, get the data in one cycle so that all the instructions will be happy, but that's not the case. To understand uh, this issue further, uh, a bit uh, deeper way of uh, quantifying things, let's assume a good enough uh, four fetch issue processor, meaning in one cycle you are fetching four instructions, and uh, frequency of the processor is four gigahertz. So uh, some of the commercial machines you will find around four gigahertz, right? So uh, this is the frequency that the time will be uh, one nanosecond. Uh, so uh, sorry, by 0.25 nanosecond for a clock cycle. And uh, in one clock cycle, as you can see, uh, you can actually fetch 16 instructions because in one clock cycle, you are uh, you, in one go, you are fetching four fetch. And in one nanosecond, you have four cycles. So four into four, 16 instructions per nanosecond. So if we take an example of uh, DRAM access uh, that takes 100 nanoseconds, which means you have around 1600 instructions that can get executed in uh, one DRAM access. So th this is the impact that uh, I'm talking about. So you should not think about that, oh, this is just one DRAM access and I, I should not be bothered about that, but that one DRAM access can actually uh, reduce or degrade your performance uh, by not uh, fetching or executing 1600 instructions. So this is a hypothetical example. Obviously the processor will be stalled after 300 or 400 depending on the instruction window. So uh, now let's look at uh, the caches that we uh, discussed a few slides before with the latency numbers. And uh, so if you want to get a latency number in uh, like few cycles, like three to four, then the typical cache sizes will be around 30 to uh, 64 KB. But as I have discussed, that won't be enough. Uh, in today's world, if you want to run with your big data and and, 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 and uh, high working set, uh, large working set uh, workloads, large graphs and all. so. What you need is you need a hierarchy of uh, caches. Okay, so uh, as you move away from the processor, uh, the size of the caches go up. Okay, obviously to improve the capacity, but of, along with that, the access latency uh, also goes up. Right, so it's a trade-off between your capacity and latency that I was talking about. Now the question is up to what level you will actually keep on uh, increasing your uh, levels in cache hierarchy. So uh, the obvious or uh, the obvious answer that, that you can think is, as long as your uh, total access latency uh, is less than the DRAM uh, latency, okay? So if that is there, then that means at least you are trying to improve your performance by, by some margin, if not completely. So as long as you are doing that, then, then you are good to add another cache level, why not an L4 also, right? So here I'm talking about three levels, let's say L1, L2, L3. 
So you may argue about running an L4 cache. As long as uh, your performance or the latency is actually uh, less than the DRAM latency, you're good to go. There are other subtle issues, but uh, at the top level, that's the uh, fundamental uh, reasoning point. So uh, at this moment, when you are looking at the multi-level cache hierarchy, the first level or the L1 cache is actually mostly designed keeping latency and bandwidth in mind. Because your processor is kind of becoming aggressive uh, day by day, it's demanding more and more loads. So uh, the L1 should have the bandwidth supposed to uh, pump more data and then, then, then uh, give it to a processor. The L2 is mostly designed for latency. So it's, it's a trade-off uh, in between L1 and L3. And L3 is uh, designed for capacity. So, so uh, here the goal is you should uh, try to keep your working set of an application at the L3 and it should not go to DRAM. Okay. So uh, with that, uh, maybe I'll look at if I have any questions. Uh, nothing so far. I hope it's clear and then it's not that fast. So feel free to say if it is uh, fast or if it is uh, boring. Uh, I'll stop and then discuss uh, a bit more. So uh, let's let's move forward uh, and try to understand uh, how to uh, access the contents or the data or the instructions which are present inside the CAS. Okay. So I talked about the notion of an SRAM array. Uh, to make it simple, I have created a matrix kind of structure. It's a 2D array where uh, each index in that uh, 2D array is actually uh, storing one byte. Okay. So th this is the entire CAS and. Uh, the notion of byte can be uh, converted into something called cache blocks or lines where each line is collection of bytes. So one row that you are seeing in the screen is actually one line. And uh, typically in the commercial machines, you will find a uh, line size of uh, 64 to 128 bytes. Okay. So now uh, let's look at how the processor interacts with the cache. Uh, so I have assumed that I have a 4 GB DRAM. So to address into a 4 GB DRAM, I will need 32 bit of address. Okay, we will we'll get into that address later. Who gives that address and uh, how, how to uh, get that address. Uh, but with that 32 bit address, now what the CAS controller will do is it will try to find out where exactly the data is, right? So in this slide, I have talked about the notion of lines and I'm showing here with an example of 1024 lines. So if there are 1024 lines and your data is present in one of the lines, you need uh, 10 bits to identify one of the lines, uh, pretty straightforward. And then once you have found out the line, uh, you need to find out which uh, particular uh, byte within those uh, line, within a particular line that you are interested in, right? So basically you will need a few bits from your address for indexing uh, to find out the line number and few bits for your uh, byte offset, okay? And the rest of the bits that are remaining, right? So that will be used as tag. Uh, I will give you a simple example uh, in next two to three slides, uh, what exactly it means. So uh, the index gives you the line number, the offset gives you the byte. The rest of the bits should be checked with the address that are sent, that, that, that is uh, communicated by the processor to make sure that we are actually looking at the same address, right? Because for a given index and offset, you can have so many uh, uh, possible uh, variations in the tag bits. And uh, so the first thing that you should check is once you get an index number, the first thing that you should check whether your tag is getting a hit, okay? And then you will get the uh, corresponding byte. So uh, this is how it uh, works. This is a typical uh, example. Uh, so I am talking about the 32-bit uh, address. So first it will go for the indexing. So in this case, uh, index is actually mentioning that it should go to line number one. Once that is done, it will go and compare the tag bit of the address that has come from the processor with the tag bit which is present in the cache. So practically, these are implemented at two different structures. One is known as the tag array and uh, the data array. So data stores the data. The tag array contains only the tag bits which will be used for uh, comparing. And then finally, if it is a hit, the tag bits are matching, then uh, you go and uh, fetch the particular byte. Okay. I hope uh, it was clear. And something that you could uh, think about uh, the, the way we are accessing the cache is why not put the index bits uh, in the MSB side and then, then uh, instead of putting the tag bits in the MSB side, right? So I, I won't uh, answer uh, this thing, but, but uh, I, I would encourage you to go and think for yourself like why uh, the, the tag bits are actually on the upper side and not in the middle of the address, uh, uh, address that we are using for indexing, okay? 
So uh, if it is not clear, then then uh, ping me. Uh, uh, we can discuss later. But uh, I want you guys to uh, look at and then uh, think for yourself. Okay. So uh, we so far we have discussed about the notion of uh, particular byte and line, but now we can go one level up and create something called a set, which is collection of lines. Okay. So in this case, uh, I'm showing set number zero, uh, which is a collection of two lines. So for each line, there is a tag. But now what is happening is uh, when, when the data comes from the data, the data can be present in one of these two lines. OK, the indexing mechanism uh, changed a bit. So instead of pointing to a particular line that you are uh, doing in the direct map cache, now you are pointing to a particular set. Then within a set, whichever line gives you a tag hit, uh, that particular line has the data. OK. So uh, you, you can look at a particular example in terms of uh, two-way cache or two-way associative cache, where you have two lines within a particular set. And the first thing that you do is you take the index bits and the index bits compare uh, with the blocks which are present. And then finally you get a set number hit for a particular set number. Once it is done, you actually go and compare the tag of the blocks which are present within a set. So since this is a two-way associative cache, so there are two blocks present within a set, you compare the tags concurrently or parallelly. And finally, whichever uh, block gives you a tag hit, based on that, you put a mux and uh, extract the data. Okay. So you can you can imagine uh, some similar operations on a four-way associative cache or a 16-way associative cache. So basically, you have a notion of uh, data array and a tag array. And then once you get the index, you go to a particular set. Your set can have multiple blocks. Whichever block gives you a tag hit, based on that you uh, extract the data. Okay. So this is the example that I was talking about. If you are still not clear of what we are discussing in the last few minutes, so the the indexing and the tag bits are uh, nothing but uh, you can uh, think about as your uh, street address and your home address, right? So the street address is actually uh, a particular street in which uh, you are searching for uh, someone, uh, your friend or relative. And then your tag bits are actually uh, uh, the, the particular address, right? Uh, the home address or, or the apartment address. And once you are uh, into a particular street and a particular uh, home address, then, then you can actually get your uh, relative or the friend, right? So which is actually the data that you are interested in. So finally, this is the extreme that we are talking about where we have no concept of uh, sets and the entire cache is kind of uh, a one set where all the blocks can uh, be participated as uh, your, your where, where your data can be placed in uh, any of the lines. OK, so here, uh, as you can see, the one difference is there is no index bit because whenever the address comes, uh, the, the, the data can be placed anywhere in the cache. And uh, when the processor requests for the data, it has to compare with all the lines. OK, it has to compare with all the tags and whichever line gives you a tag hit, uh, you go and get the data from that. OK, so this is a, a typical uh, 1000 uh, feet view about the cache indexing and how uh, the processor interacts with the caches. Uh, just a top level view on what happens when you don't get a data uh, when you request for the data and if you don't get the data and uh, so for first thing that will happen is the address is actually missing in the cache that's why you are not getting your data so the moment you get a miss for a particular address you uh, look at uh, which set you belong to and within that set how many blocks are present right so uh, th this is a simple example that talks about uh, eight way associative cache so there are eight blocks within a particular set, eight lines within a particular set. And uh, when you are requesting for an address and that address is not present, you got a tag miss, you are actually getting a cache miss essentially. And now you have to replace some blocks so that you can accommodate a new block. OK, so in this case, we are searching for, let's say, uh, block address I, which is not present. So a simple uh, eviction policy will be to uh, replace the least recently used block. In this case, this is the block H. Okay. And once the block comes from the DRAM, uh, then comes the notion of the insertion policy, 
So where exactly you put your new block in terms of the priority chain that you have already created, the notion of least recently used and most recently used. So the typical uh, textbook examples that you, have, uh, you must have read uh, talks about the new block uh, get into the most recently used position. And the third uh, sub policy that, that also part of any uh, replacement policy is the promotion policy. So whenever you get a future hit to the same block, whether you keep the promotion, uh, whether you keep the block in the same position in the priority chain, or you uh, move along. Okay. So uh, LRU uh, actually uh, is not that. Uh, it, it's actually in the commercial machine you won't find LRU getting implemented in the larger cases, uh, especially in the case of multi cores. Uh, and uh, I will talk about it a bit uh, later, uh, maybe after half an hour or so. And you will find something called uh, re-reference interval prediction based policy, which is known as RRIP based policies. So some variants of this policy is actually implemented in the commercial machine. So you can go and look at for uh, th these policies uh, whenever you get time. OK, so uh, this is the first slide where I will pause and then I will take questions. So, so far what we have discussed is uh, we have introduced the concept of CAS and why it works. It works because of the quality. And uh, we also discussed how a processor interacts with the CAS. How does it find a particular location? based on the index bits uh, and then comparing the tag bits. So uh, this is a one slide uh, summary of whatever we have discussed. So you can actually play around with the bits to find out uh, whether you are increasing the associativity of the CAS, uh, meaning number of uh, lines in a particular set or you are decreasing it, whether you are going for a direct map, fully associative CAS, and then uh, what will happen to performance based on that. OK, so uh, if there are any questions at this moment, we can uh, take it. You can put it on chat. So I'll wait for a few seconds, maybe 30 seconds. OK. OK, so, so there are a few questions. So the first question says, is there a scenario where both the blocks give a cassette during comparison possible in a two? No, 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 that, that, that's not possible. You can't get uh, hit from uh, both the blocks because the tag bits will be different. Tag bits are actually unique per block. OK, so it's uh, one on one mapping between block and tag and then the tag bits are all unique uh, in the cache. OK, you won't find the same tag bits uh, among different or among multiple blocks. So uh, another question is, is it possible to modify the number of ways dynamically or is this fixed for a particular chip? How is the line search implemented in hardware? OK, so yeah, you can actually go for a dynamic uh, uh, associative gas. So uh, you, you can find uh, plenty of papers, uh, research papers based on uh, this particular topic. Uh, maybe we can uh, discuss it offline. Uh, it's not that simple. Uh, you have to take care of subtle issues, but certainly you can uh, do it uh, with uh, other things uh, taken into account. Uh, the next question is about the line search implemented. So I didn't get it what exactly you meant by line search. So just to get you the uh, complete picture again. Uh, so here, here uh, I'm talking about an address that is coming from the processor. And then you are looking for a particular address, right? And depending on the associativity, so here we are talking about a four way associative cache. So you take the index bits based on uh, index bit, you find out which of the particular sets is actually giving you a hit for the index bit, right? So in this example, there are 256 sets. Each set has four lines. So now uh, let's say the set number three uh, gives you a hit, right? Within that, now what you need to do is you need to compare your tag bits and whichever tag uh, gives you a hit, that particular line has the data. Does that answer your question? This is the circuit. This is the exact hardware that you will see in a commercial machine. So you, you have multiple comparators that is compare, comparing the tag bits from all the lines within a set. And then finally, whichever uh, cast line is giving a hit, that will become a control signal for your marks to extract the data. OK, anything else? 
So you can take all the questions that you have this like based on the uh, topics that you have discussed so far, uh, so that we'll be in a loop before we jump into some of the advanced topics. OK, so uh, looks like there is nothing more. OK, so so let's move on then. OK, so uh, to get a complete picture about uh, the processor and where exactly the caches are accessed. So uh, I have put uh, the instruction cache and, and the L1 data cache and L2 cache for, for your reference. So th this is the typical uh, processor pipeline that you will see with the uh, out of order and, and uh, uh, branch predictor and other things. So uh, you can just correlate whenever you look at the slides from Govind and then try to correlate how caches come into picture into your processor pipeline. So, uh, so far we talked about a particular CASP and, and then the notion of CASP hierarchy, but in the commercial machines, you will find that uh, at the first level, you have two different uh, CASs. One is for instructions and one is for data. So the reason is, as I have mentioned, uh, instructions store the code that, that you are uh, executing, okay? And uh, that is used when you are fetching your instructions, okay? So once you have fetched your instruction, then it moves forward into your pipeline. And finally, whenever it needs data, it asks for uh, data from the data cache and the uh, uh, next level of cache. Okay. So one thing that you should notice here is the L2 cache is actually unified one. It stores both data and instructions. So there is uh, connections between instruction cache and data cache both. Okay. And then the, finally, you will have a large last level cache. Again, it, it is unified and then it stores both code and data. Okay. So uh, let's go a bit deep uh, in terms of uh, the typical operations that you will see in processor, like uh, loads and stores, which are uh, reads and writes. So if a processor wants to uh, load something from address X, okay, what exactly happens uh, in the presence of cache? So if it is a hit, you get the data from the cache in few cycles and it's done. If it is a miss, now, now this is a problem because your processor is actually an out of order processor. So it can't afford to just wait for one DRAM response and then, then, then move forward in the processor pipeline, right? So you need uh, a way in which you can actually handle multiple misses in one go. So that's how the commercial machines do. There's something called uh, miss status uh, holding registers. So what do they do is they can actually keep track of multiple outstanding misses, which are yet to get from the DRAM. And at the same time, the processor can move ahead. The processor should not wait for the data from the first miss to uh, move ahead, okay? To understand, let's look at this example. So you want to get the data from address X, you get a miss. So you put this into a, a queue-like structure called MSHR. Then you get a request to Y, you also get a miss. You request Z and you also get a uh, miss, okay? So if you look at, uh, depending on the size of this particular MSHR, it allows you uh, to like move forward and then and, and, uh, don't wait for the DRAM response. Uh, and then uh, indirectly, it's kind of providing some level of parallelism, right? Uh, so Govin talked about the instruction level parallelism, but here we are talking about the memory access level parallelism, right? Now the question comes, how, how come, uh, in what way the responses are handled? So uh, as I have talked about that uh, DRAM response time takes around 200, 300 cycles, but that's not true. So Vivek will talk about it tomorrow in uh, more detail, like what exactly happens. So the DRAM response latency is actually a variable latency. It can take few uh, tens of cycles, that's a 60 cycles or 2000 of cycles, depending on a, a multi-core system with extreme bandwidth scarcity. So let's assume that uh, you got misses to X, Y, Z in that temporal order, but Y got the response first. Okay, so what you do, you actually uh, uh, get data for address Y and then move ahead and then Z and then X, right? So this is again out of order response from DRAM because the latency is not constant. And uh, again, the processor is actually not waiting for the first load address X uh, before moving on to address Y or Z, okay? So let's look at what happens on a store or a write. Uh, so you want to write something into a particular address. Let's say the address is Z, and now you get a miss into your caches, okay? So the moment you get a miss, what happens is this write becomes 
uh, or the store becomes a load and it goes to DRAM to get the address first. OK, so uh, same example as before. It goes through the MSSR. Finally, when the address comes uh, into, into the CAS, uh, what the processor can do is the processor can override the data in that address. And eventually, when the block will be replaced because of some miss, that will be written back to the memory. OK, so again, this is one of the optimizations that uh, that, that uh, microarchitects use so that you should not write every time whatever you write into the CAS. OK, so that that will save bandwidth and uh, uh, there are other uh, consequences like energy and power. OK, so in general, uh, the stores are actually not critical for performance. Uh, again, uh, you should think about it, why it's not critical for performance and then and, and, uh, ping me again or if you are still not clear or if you can't think uh, still ping me or you can discuss during the afternoon. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll talk about a few on the CAS and then the CAS misses especially. So you must have uh, heard about uh, the 3C misses, the cold miss, conflict miss and capacity miss. So the misses are actually uh, the events when uh, the processor demands for a particular uh, address and that address is not there and that can happen for three reasons. If the address is actually uh, requested for first time, so this is a cold miss. Anyway, the cache is empty, there is nothing. Or it can result in conflicts because there are multiple uh, addresses actually mapped into a particular set or a particular line. That's why you are uh, getting a conflict miss. Or your cache size is small, that's why you are unable to keep track of uh, all the addresses that the processor will demand. So eventually that will lead to a capacity miss. So there is something called a coherence miss that I won't go into the detail and uh, Arka will talk about it maybe after an hour. So uh, I'll talk talk to him about uh, what exactly happened on a coherence miss in multi core system. So uh, this is something that uh, you, you should try out whenever you get time or at least think about it. So that, that will help you to understand all kinds of misses that you can get uh, in CASES. So given a CAS and given a set of uh, loads, memory references, the, the question will be like, uh, can you write a program that will provide uh, a count of different CAS misses? So I'm giving you a uh, CAS size, fixed CAS size, associativity and everything. And I'm giving you a trace of uh, loads which are generated by a processor. So can you write a program and uh, give me the count for each misses? Okay. So uh, it's actually subtle. It's not that easy. You may find that it's actually easy and you can do it in minutes, but it's not easy. Think about it and uh, ping me if, if you uh, are sure that okay you have done it uh, rightly and your your reasoning is correct. Okay. Okay. So when you are designing castles, right? So now we, we have talked about so many parameters or knobs, so line size, the associativity, the cast size. So how do you decide about all these knobs? So the trade-offs are actually uh, based on the latency and complexity, and then obviously, uh, finally, the energy and power number also come into picture. So to think about uh, how these knobs can affect your performance, well, what I would suggest to you uh, think about the extremes. So for example, if I ask, uh, how does the line size affect my performance, right? So you can go to the two extreme. One extreme is a line size can be a one byte, or a line size can be of entire cast size, like MBs. Right, and and then think about your uh, latency, complexity, and power. Right. Similarly, the associativity. Whether it's good to have associativity one, like a direct map cache, one line within a set, or all the lines within a set, like a fully associative cache. So again, whether the latency will go up, whether the comparators will be more, and then the finally the mux will be like a gigantic one. Think about it. Right. And similarly, the cache size. Uh, whether the cache size is actually you are designing it for latency or bandwidth or for the capacity. So based on this, uh, you should try to correlate with the three C misses that we discussed. So how cache size affect uh, coldness, how line size affect coldness, how associativity affect coldness, right? Similarly, you can ask questions to uh, the other two misses, whether they improve or they degrade. Okay. So th this is again, uh, you can uh, take it uh, as a uh, homework, okay, uh, or just, just uh, a thought experiment that you can think about and then uh, try to find out okay, what will happen, right? OK, so with that, uh, we, we are kind of into a zone where we should talk about uh, the performance of CAS, like how good is a particular CAS uh, with a given size or associativity. 
So typically uh, you will hear about uh, hit rate or miss rate, uh, but uh, I'm sorry to say those metrics are actually wrong. So just to give you an example why those metrics are wrong. So hit rate and miss rate uh, doesn't talk about how helpful your CAS performance is actually to the final uh, execution time of your application. Okay. So your miss rate can be one if you are getting, uh, sorry, if your hit, hit rate can be one if you are getting one access to CAS and that one access is hit and your hit rate can still be one if, if you are uh, accessing millions of accesses and all are hits, right? So it, it doesn't capture the dynamics of the instructions which are actually roaming around in the processor. So instead, uh, the better metric is uh, misses per kilo instructions. So here we have added another dimension along with the miss, which says that how many uh, or how many misses you are getting per kilo instructions, per thousand instructions. If this number is low, that means most of the instructions are getting hit into your cache, okay? Which is a good thing. And something that you, you might have read or you must have uh, heard about it, like how, how to get into the performance of a particular memory hierarchy or, or a cache hierarchy. So there are three different parameters uh, that, that play a role uh, in uh, defining the performance of a particular cache hierarchy or memory hierarchy. So first thing is, uh, what exactly is the hit time, right? So even if you get a hit, how much time it takes to get the data? And if you get, if you don't get a hit, if you get a miss, how often you get a miss? So that is the miss rate. And once you get a miss, how many cycles it takes to get the data from the lower levels of CAS or the outer levels of CAS and then from the DRAM, right? Ideally, you would want the hit time to be low, miss rate will be low and the miss penalty to be low, right? Uh, so that, uh, you don't go to DRAM at all. And then uh, to, to be like uh, super optimistic, your miss rate should be 0.0% so that you get all the hits into uh, your L1 uh, DCAS or ICAS, okay? So let's see what will happen in that case. Uh, previously, uh, I started with this uh, particular example where the instructions were actually uh, waiting for the first load uh, because it was a costly load. It was taking 300 cycles. Now, uh, let's say if you are done with few cycles, let's say L1 hit in all the cases, so you will see that all the instructions are done in uh, the four, like within uh, five cycles or whatever, depending on the L1 D access latency. Okay. So with that, I uh, will actually uh, jump into something a bit advanced, and uh, but I would suggest you to go through uh, some of the terms that I have mentioned in this slide. So you will find it uh, in uh, the book Hennessy Patterson, or you can find it uh, if you just Google it. You will find out uh, all the things. So it basically talks about different ideas or microarchitecture techniques that can improve the hit time, miss rate, or miss penalty. Uh, the CAS bandwidth also we have uh, uh, touched uh, a bit in terms of MS charts, but I will talk about the multiband CAS in the uh, next few minutes. But but I would strongly recommend uh, going through these terms and then trying to find out how they affect uh, your finally uh, your final execution time. Okay. So uh, one of the techniques uh, that I will just talk about for uh, a minute or so is something called a hardware prefetching. Uh, this is a typical CAS hierarchy that we are seeing. Uh, for the sake of simplicity, uh, multiple levels are avoided. And uh, we are talking about a new hardware structure called a prefetcher. The goal of the prefetcher is to look at all the addresses which are coming from the processor. Okay, so the simple example is x x plus one x plus two, and a trivial prefetcher can actually speculate that this program will access address x plus three in future. Okay, so it goes ahead to the DRAM, get the data uh, from the DRAM, and uh, put the data into the cache. So in future, when the processor demands for the data present in address X plus three, it gets a hit, okay? So basically it's a latency hiding technique uh, that hides the costly DRAM accesses. If you are interested, you can look at uh, this paper that appeared in SCAR 20. Uh, this is uh, work from my group. Uh, pretty uh, simple and naive idea, but uh, high performing. So uh, go through it if you are interested. Uh, Based on uh, what we have discussed so far, we are talking about performance from uh, like CASs, performance from DRAM, but uh, at the end of the day, like as a programmer, should you care or, or can you do anything to improve your uh, performance, right? So 
Let's look at uh, a typical uh, plot that, that uh, most of the folks use for uh, evaluating systems. So this is called the memory mountain. Uh, there are three different X's. Uh, one is showing the throughput or bandwidth okay, uh, in MBs per second, uh, higher the better. Then uh, there is something called size, which is the size of different caches, like 32 KB to like um, MBs and all. And it shows, uh, another X shows how you are accessing the addresses. So stride meaning the difference between your accesses. So uh, here the strides are in eight bytes or 24 bytes or 40 bytes and all. So let, let's spend uh, a minute here. Uh, if you look at the first point, right, S1, uh, which talks about uh, stride of eight bytes. So by default, the strides are multiplied by eight, okay? So if the strides are eight bytes, that means the future accesses are actually getting hit in the same cache line. So typical cache line is 64 bytes. That's why your bandwidth is high. Yeah? You're, you're getting a 8 GB, uh, 8 GBPS uh, bandwidth, okay? But, but as you increase your stride, let's say uh, 24 bytes or 40 bytes or 56 bytes, right? So somewhere around uh, here, you will cross the cache line because the cache line size is around 64 bytes. So suddenly you can see there's a drop in uh, bandwidth, okay? So similarly, if you look at uh, your cache size, the other uh, excess, uh, the 32 KB, uh, so as long as you are getting hit in the L1 cache, the bandwidth is really high, right? Uh, like 12 GBPS. The moment you go down to L2, let's say that means you are missing in L1 and you are going to L2, the uh, bandwidth goes down almost half, and then similarly to L3 and memory, right? So you can look at this plot in detail whenever you get time and then and, and think about this plot when you write programs, right? Whether your uh, programs are actually exploiting this locality or not. So uh, later in the afternoon, two of my uh, mentees, uh, Nilu and Vishal, they will actually uh, talk to you about this particular uh, memory mountain through a lab and uh, hope you will like it and you will learn something. So uh, just to uh, get a uh, like, lighter view on uh, what 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 can programmers do so i'm just showing something from uh, the turing hour lecture uh, that that uh, dave patterson gave in a uh, uh, few years ago uh, here I, i'm talking about uh, whether programming languages matter and and uh, different architecture optimizations matter for uh, the final performance improvement because at the end of the day the programmers should see the effect right so i'm not showing the y axis and we'll go slowly uh, through that. So you can assume uh, we, are, we are comparing a simple matrix multiplication and, and uh, we are comparing with a, a native uh, Python implementation. Uh, and then, the, so that, that's how we will look into this plot. So one meaning uh, Python is taking, let's say one second, and then we will look at uh, what will happen to the next, okay? So if you just uh, take a Python code and replace it with a C code, right? So this is 47 times faster. So it means if your uh, Python code takes 47 seconds, your C code takes one seconds. Okay, so that's the speed up we are talking about. Okay, and uh, if you do a bit of multi-threading or parallel programming into your loops of matrix multiplication, that that makes it uh, like 300x. Okay, so uh, just few changes, right? Change of language gives you something in the order of tens, then uh, user multi-threading gives you in hundreds. Now, assuming you know your cache hierarchy lectures better and you can actually do some optimizations for your caches, this number can go to 6,000, okay? So uh, this is not a joke, so you, you can actually uh, uh, hang on for a minute. And then uh, on top of that, if you actually know uh, the microarchitecture and then other uh, instructions uh, better, you can actually do a SIMD instruction-based implementation of the same matrix multiplication. Okay. So uh, may maybe I'll just pause a bit here and ask, like, what do you expect will be the final number here? Any, any random guess? So we have gone uh, like a long way from uh, one to six thousand. So someone is saying 9,000, 10,000, 20,000, okay. What, what else? 90,000, okay. Y axis is visible, so you can actually make a guess. Okay, this is 62,000, okay. 
So uh, hope it's not scary. Uh, you can actually try it on your own. Uh, this is not that simple to get this performance, uh, but but uh, if you spend some time and quality time on uh, your code and try to improve it, you will actually get uh, this much improvement. Okay. Again, this is not me. Okay, so this is actually from uh, Dave Patterson during during the Turing uh, lecture. Okay. So uh, let let's talk about a bit about uh, multi code, and then then uh, we'll pause for a few uh, minutes, and then we'll go for the virtual memory. Okay. So so far we have been talking about there is one core and then there is uh, one memory and there are caches in between. But in today's uh, mobiles, uh, laptops, desktop servers, everywhere you will find multiple cores, right? So each core you will see there they have their own caches, private caches, and then uh, you will see there is a large cache which is shared among all the caches, uh, among all the cores, which is actually known as the L3 or the LLC. Okay. So uh, the obvious question comes like whether to have a private cache or shared cache, and can we have a, a cache that is shared by all the cores? So the problem here becomes like a thousand monkeys uh, want to eat one banana, right? So it's a bandwidth problem. So you, you, if you want to have that, then you should have like hundreds of ports that that can support uh, concurrent accesses from all the cores to that particular cache, and obviously it's not that practical. So you should also think about your applications, right? So whether your applications is fitting into your particular private cache, or they are fitting into the last level cache, or they are thrusting into the last level cache. So if you have a shared last level cache, then the benefit of sharing of resources is, if a particular core is actually cache fitting, then uh, that particular application is not using last level cache frequently, and the space can be used by, let's say, the thrusting application, right? So it's kind of a win-win situation. Uh, not always. Uh, we will see uh, tomorrow during security and other, other topics that uh, it can actually create more issues. So uh, this is a typical uh, structure that you will see. Uh, the last level CAS here. I have. I'm talking about the L3 CAS, which is designed as four bank or four slices. Okay. So the idea of uh, slicing is instead of having one large monolithic cache, you have uh, small caches, like relatively smaller, uh, no, not uh, tiny, and then have uh, ports for each of them so that all the cores can actually try to access different slices at a given point of time. Okay, And then there will be interconnect, which will uh, actually uh, connect all the private caches of core with the different slices of last level cache. A uh, bit of uh, on the nature of the cache hierarchy. Uh, this is important again because I'll be talking about security tomorrow, so it has some security implications. So uh, there is something called the inclusive cache hierarchy where the notion of inclusiveness is whatever data you have in your L1, L2, it should be present in LLC. So LLC is actually your superset of L1, L2. So if you want to maintain that property, what will happen is whenever you get a response from DRAM, you put it in LLC. But whenever you replace a block from the LLC, you should make sure that that block is not there in uh, private caches. Okay. So this is known as uh, inclusion victim or back invalidation message, where the last level cache controller tries to make sure that I'm maintaining the inclusivity property. Okay. Uh, but the commercial machines that you'll see, they are actually mostly non-inclusive, where there is no binding between uh, the private caches and last level cache. The, that, the, 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 the data that is present in L1, L2 may or may not be there in LLC. The other extreme is the exclusive cache hierarchy. You may find some of the machines with, with uh, uh, this kind of uh, hierarchy, where on a response from a DRAM, you don't put your data into the last level cache. You put the data in your L1, L2. Only when you get a replacement in your private L1, L2, you put the data in your LNC. Okay, so if you look at uh, completely right, exclusive cache gives you the highest cache capacity because uh, the, the data which is present in L1, L2 is not present in LLC, right? But in case of inclusive, some of the space of LLC will be wasted uh, storing the data which is already there in L1, L2. Okay, so again, you can think about uh, what, what are the implications and why these designs are there. Uh, Maybe uh, talk to Arka uh, later uh, when he talked about the cache coherency and how these designs can actually affect uh, designing a, a scalable cache coherence protocol. Okay, 
So uh, with that, I will pause again, and then uh, in the next 10-15 minutes, I will talk about the virtual memory. So we can take questions uh, based on whatever we have covered so far. Okay, so there was one question where it says, in the example where the first load was taking 300 cycles, if that were due to a cold miss, it could not be avoided. Yeah, if it is for coming for the first time, you can't avoid it unless uh, you have some black magic. So yes, I agree. Uh, we have another question which says, if you have a hierarchy of caches, will the same load address will be used to decipher the line offset or will there be a buffer between each cache that converts the address? No, so the address is actually coming from the processor. Uh, so you can assume that there is an address bus which is actually communicating this address, 32-bit uh, address or whatever, to all levels of cache hierarchy. Depending on hit or miss, the address will go to the next level or outer level or not. Okay. So, so uh, what you need in between uh, the structures is actually the MSHRs and other buffers just to make sure that there is no bandwidth mismatch. Okay. But, but uh, you don't need any other structure just to. Uh, take care of these address bits. The address is anyway communicated uh, through the address uh, packet, okay? So, okay, so we have another question which says, how do you systematically approach applying the optimizations illustrated in slide 75 to real life workload? 75, oh, okay. No, this was specific to matrix multiplication. This may not be applicable to all. Uh, for example, all the applications can't be parallelized up to that extent, uh, depending on dependency, loop dependency, and other things. Similarly, uh, depending on the scope for cache optimization, whether you can actually do better uh, locality optimization in your code, uh, it, it all depends on your uh, program, right? So you look at your program and uh, look at for performance. So that's what we will do in your uh, lab session today. Maybe we can answer this during the lab, and then if you uh, don't get a proper answer, you can ping me and ask me that time. Is it parallel loop same as SIMD? No. So SIMD is different. So SIMD we are talking about the instructions. So parallel loops is if you have done some coding in OpenMP or uh, pthread, uh, then uh, that, that's actually the parallel threads. Where multiple uh, threads are actually uh, working concurrently for doing your matrix multiplication. So that's different from SIMD. We can take some more questions. We have time. Are you guys thinking? Okay, so looks like no questions. So that means everyone got it, and then all uh, the other way out. No one is getting what I'm talking about. Anyway, so uh, we are into the last ten minutes or so. Uh, and then uh, here we'll talk about the subtle uh, concept. Uh, so, so, so far uh, we have been talking about the memory hierarchy, memory wall and all, and then uh, I have been talking about the 32-bit address that the processor sends. But in general, uh, when, you, when you write your program, right? So your program actually use something called a virtual address. So simple example, if you do a printf, uh, uh, ampersand a, and then if you try to print that address, that address is actually a virtual address. Okay, so you should not use percentage d. This is this is just for uh, an example. And now, so far we have been assuming that we have a physical address that is limited by the DRAM capacity, but uh, now we are talking about virtual address. So V stands for virtual address, P stands for physical address. So that means we have something in between that that translates this virtual address into the physical address. Okay. So before that, why there is a need of uh, virtual address or why did uh, virtualization came into picture, right? So the, this is the whole uh, idea behind uh, the virtual memory where each programmer or each process or each app or whatever you can say, they can have a global view of the entire program, okay? Instead of uh, getting restricted by the DRAM capacity, they can have their own uh, software view of looking at the memory instead of uh, the DRAM view. 
And uh, through this, what we provide is we provide an illusion to the software or to the programmer that actually you can access whatever you want. Okay, so all the addresses are actually yours. And uh, but we also make sure that uh, we, we provide isolation and we provide uh, security protection and other things. Uh, uh, and then we don't we don't actually mess up your data with some other processor application. Okay. So uh, 50,000 feet view. Uh, I won't talk about page tables, so uh, otherwise it will go into uh, uh, like OS lectures. So page table is actually a data structure that is there in your DRAM. And that stores the translation between your virtual page to a physical page. So the notion of pages is a chunk of memory, uh, typically in KBs, like 4 KB. Okay, the, but uh, commercial machines you will find MBs or GBs. But for this this lecture, let's assume that uh, we have uh, pages of 4 KB. And then what happens is whenever you uh, your processor generates the virtual address, it actually goes through the page table and then then gets the physical address. Then you access the caches. Okay. So with this, uh, what, what is happening now is you, for every access that you are making from your uh, virtual address, you are actually uh, going through the page table and the page table is actually in uh, uh, DRAM. OK, so that will demand uh, more and more DRAM accesses. So this is again a 50,000 feet view of uh, the page table walk. So your page table is actually stored in DRAM as I have already mentioned. So the way it works is your goal is to find out the physical address okay, or the physical page. Okay, so there is a register called CR3 uh, that gives you the root address of the first level of page table. It's actually a multi-level page table. And then what you do is you take a few bits at a time from the virtual address and then uh, try to get into your final physical page. So I won't go into the detail uh, of this particular slide. So this is actually uh, doing uh, four to five level of uh, DRAM accesses for a given translation. If you are interested, we can discuss it later, uh, but the takeaway message is one translation can uh, create uh, four to five uh, DRAM accesses depending on uh, how many levels you have, okay? So uh, similar concept again, so can we cache the translations in, in the way we are caching the data and instruction? So the answer is yes. And uh, there are structures like TLBs, uh, which are known as the translation look aside buffer, so they store the translation from a virtual page to physical page. OK, so if you get a hit in this TLB, there is no need to do the page table walk. And uh, once you get a TLB hit, you get a physical address and you move ahead. OK, so uh, just to bring uh, TLB into your context, uh, so your typical uh, textbook will have this five stage. Now, before accessing memory uh, like L1 ICAS or L1 DCAS, you need a TLB now. And, and, and uh, each TLB should have uh, the translation for uh, the virtual address that you are looking for. OK, ideally. So in terms of memory hierarchy, where exactly this TLBs are. So again, similar to the cache hierarchy, you will have TLB hierarchies. So you have L1 TLBs. Again, these are private. If you get a miss in the L1 TLB, you go to L2 TLB. OK, uh, don't get confused with L2 cache. OK, so L2 cache is still uh, not accessed. We are still in the translation phase. We are trying to get the physical address. If you get a miss in the L2 TLB, we go for the page table walker. So this is uh, the circuit that I talked about a few slides before. It's a finite state machine that goes through uh, different levels and finally finds out the physical address. Once you get the physical address, then you go to your L1 cache to get the data. OK, so that's how it works. So uh, just to make it a bit more subtle. So now there are three possibilities for designing your caches, especially the L1 cache, which is closer to the processor. So you can have a physical cache. That means your uh, address which is coming to the cache is physical address. It's already translated. Or you can have a virtual L1 cache, which means you operate the entire cache with virtual address. Okay. Or you can have a sandwich approach where you do few things with using virtual address and few things using physical address. Okay. So let's look at uh, the implications of all. Uh, so the first one is pretty clear with physical cache. There is a performance penalty attached that uh, you need to do the translation first and then you have to go to the cache. But what if we go for a virtual cache? Like everything is done through virtual address uh, instead of going to a TLB. So there are two problems. Uh, first problem is called uh, the synonym problem. And in the synonym problem, what happens is there are two different virtual addresses. They are mapping to the same physical page. Okay. 
So it, you can think about uh, some page uh, which is shared among two processes or two apps or some library which is shared across two apps, right? Now, if you are using your uh, L1 cache as a virtual cache completely, right? So now you will have uh, two different copies of the same data, right? So we, which will create uh, issues if one of them actually writes to a particular uh, version of that, that address, the other guy won't be able to see it, right? So the simple uh, solution for this problem is you should actually do uh, a direct map cache so that whenever uh, VA1 wants to write something, so with the direct map cache, VA1 and VA2 will be mapped to the same particular location. And, and uh, whenever someone wants to update, uh, the other one will be kicked out. Or So at least you will have only one unique copy of data at a given point of time for a given virtual address. Okay. There is another problem called homonym problem where a given virtual address can map to different physical address. So this is simple example with multiple processes working on with their own uh, virtual addresses. The example that I have shown, like uh, process one is using virtual address 100, process two is also using virtual address 100, but they are actually essentially uh, mapping to two different physical pages, right? So what can you do? You can actually flush it uh, the moment you actually switch uh, from one process to another process, or uh, you can actually do you know, physical tag instead of virtual tag. We will see how that how that helps. Or you can actually put a process ID for, for each of these CAS entries so that you know that, okay, this particular uh, virtual address with process ID P1 belongs to, uh, process ID P1 is actually mapped to this line and process ID P2 is mapped to some other line, okay? So you will find the L1 CASES are typically implemented as uh, virtually indexed physically tagged. So what I mean with that is you go for indexing with the virtual address Okay, uh, go for searching your set number using the virtual address. And at the same time, you send the address to the TLB. The TLB has the translation from virtual to physical address. Both the things can go concurrently. And uh, finally, the hope is that by the time you are done with your indexing to find the set number, the TLB would have given you a hit and you get a tag, okay, which is actually a physical tag. So that, that solves the problem that we are talking about, the homonym problem, right? Uh, one subtle thing that uh, we should be aware of is the index and the block offset bits should be within the page size or the page offset. So I am, I've, I've been talking about the page size of 4 KB. So to address 4 KB, you need uh, 12 bits. So which means uh, the number of sets that you can have in your Elon cache cannot be more than 64, at least in this case. The block size is 64 bytes, that will take 6 bits. And you have rest six bits only for uh, indexing. That means you can have 64 sets. Why is it? Because the moment you cross this thin line, okay, then, then you are actually going into the uncertainty of virtual world. Then again, you will have problems of synonyms, okay? So this is uh, one of the reasons why your L1 cache sizes are pretty small when they use virtually indexed physical cache. You will find sizes of 32 KB or 48 KB, okay? Uh, something that you should look at when you get time. So this is a link from uh, uh, Intel recent uh, microprocessor Sony Corp. Uh, you can uh, look at the cache sizes, the TLB sizes, and then how things look at in a, a real processor. Okay, and try to correlate with whatever you have discussed. Uh, with that, uh, I will stop, and then then a uh, few slides on uh, some research questions uh, before I wrap it up. So. Some of the research questions are, uh, you, you may find they are a bit conventional, but we, with the new application domain, uh, you may find, okay, they, they are still of interest. So for example, memory hierarchy for graph, uh, machine learning, uh, vision workloads, and then uh, in, in the very uh, first point that you can see, uh, achieving performance closure to ideal DTLBs, L1D or L1I, right? So that will be the uh, dream world that uh, I have been talking about. And then uh, maybe Manu or Vivek will talk about non-volatile caches, where caches will uh, keep the data even if you switch off your machine. How to design, what are the issues, uh, how OS can actually interact with memory hierarchy uh, in terms of uh, virtualization and data centers. So the way to look at uh, these topics is look at this uh, conferences like ISCA, Micro and all, and try to find out uh, papers of interest uh, of these topics, okay? So one of the key takeaways that I should uh, mention here is 
the guys who work on these topics, uh, they're actually microarchitects uh, because CASIS is actually part of microarchitecture. And they work hard even to get uh, like 0.5% improvement in the real hardware, right? So if Intel gets or AMD gets 1% uh, improvement, so uh, that's because of uh, these microarchitects. And so the, there is an anonymous uh, saying that uh, the microarchitects can kill their grandmothers even to get 0.5% uh, improvement. Okay, so I, I won't say who has mentioned it. So, uh, but but uh, the, this is the reality. Okay. Uh, a few uh, points on how to start uh, and then uh, how, how to get into this. So uh, you should be passionate about these topics and then you should be interested in uh, the why and the how of it and not the what. Okay. And then few link that I have put it. Uh, this is from Richard Feynman on scientific method. So this is a hyperlink. So if you click on it, you will get it. Uh, and then a few blogs that you can uh, look at just to start uh, your uh, like exploration, how do you want to start your research? OK, so with that, I will uh, end up and we may take questions for next four minutes or so. Uh, if you have any feedback or pointers on the slides or anything that is not clear, just, just feel free to reach me. Uh, don't don't uh, overthink, just just shoot an email or just just ping me on MS team. Uh, just a word of caution that this is, I, I won't say this is a 10,000 feet view, this is even like a 50,000 feet view on CASIS. Uh, because within one hour, it's it's just uh, next to impossible to uh, go through each and everything. But uh, dig deep uh, to more about it, and, and and if you have any questions, then feel free to uh, ping me. Okay. So with this, we will take questions for a few minutes, and then uh, we'll wrap up, so that you will get at least 10-15 minutes of break before uh, Arka starts. So I can't see anything, so I'm assuming uh, there are no questions. Or maybe I can just wait for a minute. So the labs will start at 2.30, but it would be good if you can join by 2.20 or so. And uh, we have created a channel called, uh, I think, Biswa Interaction, where uh, uh, we will be discussing uh, all the lab issues. Okay, it, it seems there are uh, no, oh, okay, there, there is something, okay. So the question is what kind of CASIS are used in commercial processor, virtual, physical, virtual, yeah, so as I mentioned, right, the first level CASIS are uh, uh, virtually indexed and physically tagged, uh, VIPT CAS, and uh, the L2 and L3 are physical CAS, okay. Uh, how much improvement is physically indexed virtual? No, I think the question was different. How much improvement was virtually indexed physically tagged over physical CAS? Yeah, the improvement comes because of the TLB lookup. So with the physical uh, CAS, you have to uh, go for TLB lookup first. And if you get a miss in the L1 TLB, you go for L2 TLB and then paste table lock and all. But in reality, what happens with virtually indexed is the moment you get a TLB miss, you move ahead and start uh, fetching uh, other loads. You st start looking for other loads, and then uh, there's no need to wait for uh, this particular translation. You can actually do it later. Uh, can you please say some reading materials, maybe from your lecture, standard books on these topics for revision and better understanding of the subsequent days? So, uh, one of the classical books that the entire world follows is Hennessy Patterson, but uh, yeah, within four days, it, it may not be uh, easy to get uh, everything. Uh, but yeah, so we will be sharing all the slides and then uh, so you can actually go through it later in the day uh, or maybe during the labs and then, then uh, to have a better understanding for the rest of the topics. We have few more seconds before we wrap up. Hi, Biswa, could you um, also mention what is needed for the lab and uh, the, what so some students had, uh, I think one of them wrote saying uh, some exercise for the lab. Bebajit, are you there in uh, the session? Could you speak up? 
Let me stop uh, sharing my screen. I, I did not have my laptop today. So, for the lab session. Okay, so uh, at least you can attend it and then, then see it for yourself, uh, even if you don't have uh, the laptop. Any instructions I, for installations and stuff will be posted in the channel. No, that I have already posted. That I have already posted. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. So okay. I think some of them have actually uh, looked at it, uh, looked into it. So yeah. Anyway, we will go through it in detail uh, sometime around 2:20, and then we'll make sure that you get into uh, the tool uh, seamlessly. Okay. Okay. Oh, OK, then, so I guess uh, it's, it's a break time. So uh, I should uh, hang out now. OK, so thanks again, and then and feel free to reach out for anything. Bye. So we come back at 12, right? Um, yeah. Thank <laughs> you.